Zayed Alexander. <laughs> You guys, is this on? Is this thing on? You guys are absolutely fucking brilliant. Thank you so much for coming out on this Saturday morning. I know it's a little bit earlier than we're used to, but we've got so much brilliant and fantastic information for you guys that we needed the whole day. So uh, kudos to you all for getting up early and making your drives in and, and from wherever you've been. We've got so many, like, can we see a show of hands from people who are here from outside of Ontario? <laughs> Anyone here from the States? <laughs> awesome. Thank you for coming out making that. I really appreciate it. So for, the, for those of you that don't know, my name is Patrick Joseph White. My beautiful wife, Kadina, and my gorgeous daughter, Madison, we are Conspiracy Culture. <laughs> just celebrated our 10-year anniversary just in August. So this is probably, you know, we've done over 100 of these events. Uh, our core values at Conspiracy Culture are product, perspective, and special events, so that's what we do. You can check us out online 24-7 at conspiracyculture.com. Uh, enough about me already. Uh, today we're here for Graham Hancock. So his books have sold more than 7 million copies and have been translated into 30 different languages. His lectures, his radio and television appearances, and his strong presence on the internet have put his ideas before audiences of tens of millions. <coughs> Voted number 14 in the Watkins list of the 100 most spiritually influential living people, can we please have a very warm Toronto welcome for the legendary Grand Hancock. two talks today uh, on two different areas of my work. The first talk is on what I call the quest for the lost civilization. Uh, I guess quite a few of you were here last year, right, when the talk I gave last year. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming back, your gluttons for punishment. Um, there will be elements in the first talk which overlap with the elements that I covered last year, but there's a lot of new material as well. And, integrated in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so I'm, I'm calling this talk a Ancient Astronauts or a Lost Civilization. I think you all know what my view is, uh, that we're, we're dealing with a lost civilization. But I do want to touch on the, the issue of ancient astronauts, and I'll begin with, uh, with doing that. Uh, of course, the book behind my Lost Civilization work, the latest book, is Magicians of the Gods, and chapter and verse on a lot of what I'm saying here will be found in there. I want to pay tribute and give a huge thank you to my wife, Santa. Uh, Santa is a professional photographer. She was a professional photographer when I met her. We've worked together for 25 years. Uh, we have made every journey together, shared every adventure, shared every risk. Um, she's, uh, when I told her in... 1996 that we had to learn to scuba dive and she had to learn to photograph underwater, she did it. Uh, and uh, uh, most of the images, almost all of the images that I'll be showing you today are Santa's images. We desperately tried to get the projector into sharp focus, but I'm afraid it just will not speak to us properly. So some of the images are going to be a bit fuzzy, but I want to make it clear that is not Santa's fault. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have done anything that I've done. I wouldn't have got anywhere in this world if it hadn't been for the Santa as the uh, strong, positive force of truth behind me. And teaching me the value and the, and the meaning of love. Okay. So. Confronted by the monuments, by 
the antiquity, by the vastness of the projects that we find in ancient archaeological sites, we can't help but wonder, you know, what actually is going on? What is, what is it all about? Um, and when we see uh, in the crypt at Dendera, for example, uh, a, a design like this, it is tempting to suppose that we're looking at some kind of out-of-place technology. It does look a bit like a sort of light bulb, a spark plug or something. Um, and uh, I think it's quite natural to, to wonder, and many people do wonder, and my friend Eric von Daniken, who I have great respect for, was really the first to put forward the notion of ancient astronauts, that the only possible explanation for these kind of uh, technological uh, artifact, uh, imagery, is that uh, we were visited by and um, taught by aliens. Uh, and again, I mean, when we look what modern tech does with two or three hundred ton blocks, uh, it is a mystery. It is a it is a wonder how how the ancients did uh, all all of, all of this. And uh, yeah, Giorgio says it was it was aliens, um, and he's of course following in in Eric's uh, footsteps there. Uh, and I get it. I get it. I understand why people feel that that must be the explanation because some of the mysteries are are so huge. But let's consider some possibilities. Well, these objects um, in the hands of the great statues of Tiwanaku in Bolivia are often uh, highlighted as alien ray guns by the ancient alien lobby. Uh, but uh, that's not actually what they are. They're much more interesting than that. They're uh, snuff trays uh, for the consumption of dimethyltryptamine snuffs. Um, and this has been friendly established by Dr. Dr. Emmanuel Torres. And in fact, such snuff trays are still found uh, in the Amazon. And Adenantra gives you a snuff that is pretty much pure DMT and sends you on a rocket ship to the other side of reality. And that kind of rocket ship I can go for. Uh, uh, not everything that looks like a, a landing strip for, for ET spacecraft is a, is a landing strip. I had the privilege of knowing Maria Reiche uh, and spending quite a bit of time with her before she passed away. And, and she really disliked the ancient astronaut idea. And she pointed out that if people tried to land on the Nazca Plateau, they would simply have got stuck. You can't land on it. It's a um, relatively soft surface. The, the explanation must lie somewhere else. These are definitely not landing strips. Uh, and not all megaliths are old. Uh, on uh, a recent uh, research journey in uh, Indonesia, uh, Santa and I, came up against several existing megalithic cultures, which are still creating megaliths today. Uh, these ones are at uh, Bori Parindi um, in South Sulawesi. Uh, and uh, they're really rather modern. The oldest is about 200 years old, and they're still making them today. Uh, some of them weigh in the range, range of 20 tons. Um, they bring them a distance of about five kilometers to the site. I asked them, actually, how do you do that? Um, do you use buffaloes and, and uh, rollers? And, and they said, no, no, we don't use buffaloes. We use about 300 men who haul them on rollers to the site. And then afterwards, we eat the buffaloes in peace. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and you know, and they, they are making these things today. So not all megaliths are old. There are existing megalithic cultures still in the world, although I do believe that they are uh, the inheritors of a deeply ancient, remotely ancient tradition. Uh, not everything that looks, uh, not everything ancient that looks like an alien spaceship is actually an alien spaceship. Uh, this is a petroglyph from uh, the mountains of Armenia. Uh, we were up there with Armenian friends looking at this incredible rock art. And the friends were telling us that actually there's lots of UFO sightings there. So we were very excited to see this because, my goodness, it does look a bit like a flying saucer uh, with these sort of jets of flame uh, coming out below. Um, but uh, let's look closer. Um, again, you can see here sort of double dome and four jets of flame coming out below. It's very tempting to conclude that we're looking at an ancient image of a, of a flying saucer, but we're not. Uh, again, just to make the point, uh, what we're actually looking at are images of ibexes. Um, you can see there that the horns curl over to the back, and, and if I show you this one, I think you'll get it clearly. This one, they didn't complete the curve of the horn. So there's absolutely no doubt about it. These are images of ibexes, which were animals that were hunted and eaten in that area in the upper Paleolithic. They're definitely not images of alien spacecraft. Baalbek in the Lebanon is uh, 
a particular um, favorite of the ancient astronaut lobby, uh, Zachariah Sitchin, argued that it was a, a landing platform for ET craft coming from the planet uh, Nibiru. Um, and the argument was made that these landing crafts were so heavy that a massive megalithic platform, solid megaliths, had to be built to support the weight of the landing craft. Let's see if Baalbek uh, lives up to that expectation. Um, I'm going to take you around the site. I'm, I'm sitting in the temple, uh, in the center of the Temple of Jupiter, and that is the, um, the ruined Temple of Jupiter, and that is the platform that, the, that, that I'm sitting on here that the ancient astronauts, a lot of say, was a, a landing platform for alien spacecraft built with massively heavy megaliths. Now, there's no doubt that what's lying around me here is Roman. These are definitely the six remaining Roman columns out of 54 that once surrounded the cella of the Temple of Jupiter. In the background, we see the Temple of Bacchus. Um, but let's go on. Um, just a diagram to familiarize you. Here is the Temple of Jupiter platform that is cited as the landing platform. Those are the six uh, Roman columns that I showed you in the photograph. But interestingly, surrounding the platform is a U-shaped megalithic wall, which is quite separate from the platform, separate and distinct. Uh, and in that wall are three just enormous blocks, which are called the triliton, and we'll come to those. So to orient you a little bit, this is U-shaped megalithic wall is what really interests me. And the platform is, uh, in my view, uh, undoubtedly Roman, but I don't think the megalithic wall is. So I'm back, back in the center there, uh, just to give you uh, a sense of the, the whole place. Those are the six columns that we're looking at here. Let's go take a look at the north side of that megalithic wall. We'll look down, oh no, I'm going to show you the Temple of Bacchus first, just for fun, because the Romans uh, did dedicate a temple to the god of wine. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, let, now we're going to look up at the uh, platform of the Temple of Jupiter. We're looking in this direction up here. And you can see that in the foreground and looking up into the platform of the Temple of Jupiter, it's all small blocks. It's not, it's not megalithic blocks. Um, and when we stand on the platform of the Temple of Jupiter and look, and look down, this is what we look at. And we can see again that if we're dealing with where, where excavations have revealed very small blocks, certainly not megalithic, certainly not uh, to support some massive weight. Um, back in the center of the Temple of Jupiter, all of these blocks are of Roman provenance. The Romans were really handy at moving very large blocks of stone. Let's not uh, minimize what they could do. They're, they're, the Romans were quite capable of moving two or three hundred ton blocks and actually raising them up to huge heights. Uh, but if we go to the north side, uh, those were the six columns. Over here is the north side of the megalithic wall. And as you can see, it does completely surround the temple on three sides, but it's separate from, it, from them. There's a gap of about 35 or 40 feet here. Uh, and this is where you find the, the big megaliths, is in this U-shaped megalithic wall. Uh, another shot of it here. Here's the platform of the Temple of Jupiter. Nothing special. Roman work, not huge blocks at all. But down here, we have these giant, giant blocks of stone. It's blocks of stone like this, particularly the Triliton I'll come to, which are referred to, which are cited as, as evidence that this was a platform for alien spacecraft. But actually, uh, I don't think an alien spacecraft would land on that wall. I think the wall's too narrow to land a spacecraft on. And this is not big blocks. And anybody who tells you that this is made of giant blocks is not telling the truth. Um, the other side of the wall, the south side of the wall, is where we start seeing, again, humongous blocks, and I'm coming up the stairs, and there you can see the south side of that megalithic wall surrounding the platform of the Temple of Jupiter. Uh, and again, just another, another shot of it. Uh, so we go back to the north side of the wall. There's that, there's that wall. And let's uh, take a look at the size of these blocks. Um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, in there for, for scale. They're really huge. But it's when we go around the corner onto the western end of that wall that we see the really giant megalith. And this is called the Triliton. And here are the 
three blocks of the triliton, uh, which each weigh somewhat in excess of 900 tons. Uh, that's approximately 450 large SUVs. Uh, each one of them weighs 900 tons, and they're joined together so closely that you can't get a, a sheet of paper uh, into the gaps in the, in the joints. Um, I'm again here to scale. I'm pointing at the southernmost of those three silicon blocks. And here, you can see that gap in the masonry there. Here's that gap. I'm actually sitting on top of it here. Uh, being filled in in later time, the gap in between the two. I'm sitting on top of that block here. And those are the three huge 900-ton blocks of the silicon. Now, in this shot, in front of my right foot is a block which archaeologists use as their killer argument to tell us that the Romans built everything at Baalbek. Not only the platform of the Temple of Jupiter, but also the U-shaped megalithic wall that surrounds it. And they say that it, that it must have been built by the Romans, because when we excavate this block a bit, what we find is that it is a fragment of a Roman column, of those fallen columns from up on top. A fragment of it is being used here in the foundations of the megalithic wall. And so the archaeologists, and I get it, they say, look, there's a, there's a reused a Roman column, a fragment of a Roman column in the foundations of this wall. There's a Roman temple on top, on the Temple of Jupiter. Of course, the Romans built everything. Let's unpack that a bit. Let's, uh, let's think about this. I got into detailed um, correspondence with uh, Daniel Lohmann, who's an architect and, uh, and an archaeologist working with the German Archaeological Institute. He was actually very helpful for me, and we debated this a lot. Um, you see, the fact is that Baalbek was used as a fortress uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years after its original uh, creation. It was used as a fortress by the Arabs in the wars of the Crusades. Uh, this fortress was attacked multiple times. It was, they used those huge catapults to throw giant rocks at it, and they undermined the foundations. And when the foundations were undermined, repair blocks were put in, which often recycled old stuff that was lying around. And that's what I believe that Roman column in the foundations of that wall is. I think it's a repair block. And here we see another Roman column being used in a wall that nobody disputes was built up by the Arabs um, in the 8th and 9th century AD. They have also reused a Roman column uh, in the construction of the wall. Uh, so there's a Roman column that is cited as the killer argument for the Romans doing everything. And here's a Roman column in a bit of wall that we know was put there by the Arabs. And really, it's very similar. Work. So I think we have to consider the possibility that that Roman column is indeed a repair block, uh, repairing undermined foundations uh, during the attacks on Baalbek, and therefore cannot be taken as proof that the Romans built everything. It gets more mysterious when you go off to the quarry. When you go off to the quarry, you find even bigger blocks sitting there. Uh, the argument is that the Romans uh, quarried out all these blocks, but then they found that they were just a bit too big for them to move. So they left them on the site. Uh, this one is called uh, the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. I don't know why. I'm standing on top of it. It weighs a 1,000 tons. Uh, it's cleanly separated from the bedrock down here below, um, which is curious in itself. Across the road, on the other side of the road, there's an even larger block. This one weighs 1,250 tons. Um, it is now being used as a rubbish dump, unfortunately. <coughs> Um, but it's very intriguing. Uh, and just in 2014, this block was discovered. Uh, the German Archaeological Institute had been working at the site for 100 years, so it seems extraordinary that they wouldn't discover this block until 2014. Uh, but the reason they didn't discover it was that it was covered in sediment, and they had to excavate that sediment in order to reveal that another huge block lies under it, and the calculations indicate that that block uh, you can see I'm standing on it here. That's the stone of the pregnant woman above me. That's the front edge of that large block. Um, that, that block actually weighs 1,460 tons. So the argument is that the Romans uh, built uh, everything uh, and that they, this was their quarry uh, and that uh, they found they couldn't move these blocks. I would say that that's a very un-Roman thing to do. The Romans were practical, pragmatic people. Let us suppose that they had indeed 
quarried out these blocks and, and actually cut them to shape and then discovered they couldn't move them. I don't believe that the Romans would have left those blocks there in the quarry because they were still building their temples. What the Romans would have done would have been to slice these humongous blocks up uh, like loaves of bread into smaller blocks, which could easily be transported to the site and used alongside many other smaller blocks in the construction of the temple. I think the Romans didn't know these blocks were there. I think the whole place that is regarded as the quarry was actually deeply covered in sediment, and that the Romans never visited this site. If the Romans had been there, we would not be seeing these blocks. They would be gone, because a lot of work had already been done on them, and they didn't waste work in that way. <coughs> So let's go from Baalbek uh, in the Lebanon uh, to Giza in Egypt and to the, the three great pyramids of Giza. This is actually the great pyramid. Uh, there's four pyramids in the shot. Actually, there's many more smaller satellite pyramids, but it's these three attributed to Menkara, uh, Khafre, and Khufu uh, that we're interested here, and that's the great pyramid sitting over there. The Great Pyramid is aligned to within three sixtieths of a single degree of true north. It speaks to our planet. And that is an incredible feat of setting out and engineering. The Great Pyramid weighs six million tons. It consists of two and a half million individual blocks of stone. It stands 481 feet high. And it has a footprint of more than 13 acres. To take a monument on that scale and align it to within three sixtieths of a single degree of true north is stunning, stunning accuracy, which is far beyond anything that the ancient Egyptians should have been capable of. And I understand why ancient astronaut theorists think that it must have been the work of astronauts. But let's think about this. If you can cross interstellar space, if you can even cross our solar system, and navigate to the pale blue dot that we call the Earth. Your navigation is really, really good. And if you're going to build a pyramid, you're not going to make a mistake. You're not going to align it even 3 sixtieths of a single degree on true north. You're going to align it perfectly to true north. Uh, so I see no evidence for an ancient astronaut presence uh, in the alignment uh, of the Great Pyramid. I see human workmanship. Uh, done to a level that far exceeds the technological abilities that are attributed to the ancient Egyptians. And it's interesting, uh, because not only is the Great Pyramid speaking to our planet by locking on to true north, uh, but it's also speaking to our planet in another way. Actually, Egyptologists know this, but they say it's a coincidence. Um, if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. And if you measure the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by the same number, 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. So actually, in all those centuries and millennia, when our ancestors supposedly didn't even know that they lived on a planet, let alone the dimensions of the planet, all anybody needed to do was go measure the Great Pyramid accurately multiply by 43,200, and they would have the dimensions of our Earth uh, to with, within an average margin of error of less than half of 1%. And that's very, very, very precise. And it's certainly beyond the knowledge attributed to the ancient Egyptians. But again, I would say it's not ancient astronaut precise. What it's about uh, is a phenomenon called the precession of the X. This little gif uh, gives you an idea of what precession is. It's like the wobble on the top when it's slowing down. Our Earth does that. It wobbles on its axis. And this wobble takes 25,920 years to complete a full cycle. And because the Earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars, this change, this precessional change in the orientation of the Earth in the heavens changes the star field. It alters the appearance of the star field, the rising kinds of stars, the seasons that they arise, and actually their angle as they're observed in the sky. Uh, it's most obvious at the pole. Uh, what is the pole star, except the star that the extended north pole of our Earth points most directly at? And in our time, and for the last couple of thousand years, uh, that pole star has been the star that we call Polaris. Very easy to spot. Um, but it hasn't always been Polaris. 
and it won't always be Polaris because of this phenomenon. Sometimes the extended north pole of the Earth will point at empty space, and sometimes it will point at the totally other star. There have been other pole stars in the past. So it's visible at the poles, and it's also uh, very noticeable on the horizon. When I say very noticeable, you need to observe for a very long time, because this process unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. And one degree is roughly the width of your finger held up to the horizon. So to observe this, you need to keep records. You need to pass information down and observe it and measure it. But it unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. This affects the constellation that lies behind the sun at uh, certain key moments of the year, uh, particularly the constellation that lies behind the sun on the spring equinox, the March equinox, 21st of March in the Northern Hemisphere. That constellation for the last couple of thousand years has been the constellation of Pisces. We live in the age of Pisces. It's not an accident that the early Christians used the fish uh, as their symbol. But as we all know, we do live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Uh, and the processional shift is underway. And within the next 100 to 200 years, the sun will rise against the background of the constellation of Aqu Aquarius and gradually track through it. And we will be in the age of Aquarius. Um, and and uh, this is the other area in which precession becomes very evident in the star field. I hope that that's a clear enough explanation of what is going on here. Both the pole and the zodiacal constellations are involved in these observations. The rate of change is one degree every 72 years. That gives you a complete house of the zodiac, 30 degrees in 2,160 years, and a full cycle, which the ancients called the great year, uh, in 25,920 years. Read this book. Um, it's uh, really an extraordinary uh, academic achievement. Uh, Giorgio de Santigliano was a professor of the history of science at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, <coughs> and Hertha von Deschen was professor of history of science at uh, Frankfurt University. Uh, and they have documented in this stunning book ancient worldwide knowledge of the precession of the equinoxes. Very, very, very ancient. And it seems that somebody wanted to pass this knowledge down to the future because they embedded the knowledge in wonderful stories, the stories that we call myths, stories that would be told and retold down the generation, stories that were accompanied by an instruction that they should always be told truth, stories that contained sequences of numbers. And it didn't matter whether the storyteller knew that he or she was passing on scientific information. All that mattered was that they passed it on, that they told the story truth. 72 is the heartbeat of the processional cycle, and one, one degree of procession. And the number 72 generates a whole sequence of other numbers that are all over ancient mythology, very often accompanied by references to a cataclysmic global flood, and very often um, uh, 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 set in, in these amazing stories. Number 72, and, and accompanied also by imagery of a churning, twisting motion in the heavens, hence uh, Hamlet's Mill. Um, so if we take 72 and we add half of 72 to that, we get 36. 72 plus 36 is 108. That's also a precessional number. Divide 108 by 2, you get 54. Multiply 72 by 30, you get 2,160. Double that, you get 4,320. You can max it up to 43,200 or even 432,000. Uh, the numbers are there, and these numbers keep on repeating in ancient mythology all around the world, accompanied by imagery of uh, twisting and churning process in the heavens. Uh, and that is why we cannot ignore the measurements of the Great Pyramid. Because the scale that is used, 1 to 43,200, is one of those precessional numbers. It can't be an accident. And, and the, the fact that they are using that scale means that they've done something very clever. They've given us the dimensions of our planet on a scale defined by a key motion of the planet itself. This, in my view, cannot possibly be coincidence. 
Santayana and von Deschen agree that the system is expressed not only in myth, but also in architecture. So at the, the, the avenues of statues at Angkor in Cambodia, uh, you get 108 statues in each avenue, 54 on each side. And what are they doing? They're churning the Milky Ocean. The, the, the great serpent Bazuki is wrapped around Mount Mandera and angels and demons are pulling on either end of Bazuki and they're churning Mount Mandera, generating Amrita, the elixir of immortality. Interestingly enough, uh, Angkor lies exactly 72 degrees of longitude east of Giza in Egypt. It's hard to notice that because these days we set our prime meridian through Greenwich. Uh, and you have to do the math to work it out. But if you imagine, as we believe is the case, that the ancient prime meridian ran through Giza, then it immediately becomes apparent that Angkor lies 72 degrees east of Giza, a significant processional number. Uh, of course, there are many other sites on this grid, which I don't have time to go into in depth at the moment. But Angkor is there. It's 72 degrees of longitude east of Giza. There are 72 major temples at Angkor. Uh, and uh, Angkor, actually the words have a meaning in the ancient Egyptian language. They mean life to Horus. Life to Horus, Angkor. This is Angkor Wat. Uh, and we are on the east side of Angkor Wat in a helicopter here. That was a scary ride. Ca Cambodian, I mean, Cambodian military helicopter. Uh, it was like Apocalypse Now, actually. Um, and uh, we're looking west. And you can see that the avenue that runs right through the center of the whole thing, goes off to the moat there, and then it crosses the moat and disappears into the distance, miles and miles away, vanishes off the horizon. This line is perfectly oriented due east and due west. It's targeted on east and west, and perfectly, without error. It runs right through the center of Angkor. The same thing happens with the Sphinx. The Sphinx is also perfectly targeted on due east. There is not a single contemporary reference. The Egyptologists believe the Sphinx was made in 2500 BC. There is not a single contemporary reference from 2500 BC that speaks of the Sphinx. We don't find any pharaohs speaking of the Sphinx until a long time after that, as a matter of fact. And they're referring to it as an incredibly ancient monument. Let's just concentrate on the orientation. The Sphinx faces due east. Let me prove that to you. Uh, if you get up illegally on the back of the Sphinx, uh, and you're there at the summer solstice, the 21st of June, your sun is going to be rising way over there. And should you be there at the winter solstice, the 21st of December, the sun's going to be rising way over there. But if you get up on the back of the Sphinx on the spring equinox, this is what happens. You see that the Sphinx is gazing directly at the rising sun on the spring equinox. So it is an equinoctial marker, just like Angkor Wat. It's designed to marry heaven and earth on that special day, as above, so below. And here's the magic of Angkor. Uh, as you stand dead center in that processional, cause, processional causeway, and you look right, right at the central tower, the sun begins to rise up the side of the central tower, and then, lo and behold, sits right on top of the central tower. And the whole place lights up like a fairy tale kingdom. And it's doing exactly what the great Sphinx does, looking at the rising sun at dawn on the spring equinox. When we look at the major temples of Angkor, we find that they transcribe a pattern on the ground, a serpentine pattern. Uh, and that is actually the pattern of the constellation of Draco. Draco in the sky. Rocco on the ground. And it's really detailed. I mean, these little ancillary temples near Rolos are <coughs> mapping these stars in the Corona Borealis. Uh, the Western Nebo is mapped. It's a very complex and, and uh, I believe, amazing map of the constellation of Draco. But the question is, when is it a map of the constellation of Draco? Angkor, in its present incarnation, uh, dates back only 900 years or so, so about 1100 years. 50 uh, AD. Um, but uh, Angkor was built on the site of an older sacred site, which in turn was built on the site of an older and an older sacred site. And I believe the blueprint for Angkor was laid down a very long time ago. It's a plain fact. 
that you cannot get that correlation of sky and ground on the spring equinox in the time that Angkor was supposedly built in its present incarnation, neither at sunrise nor at sunset. But if you go back to 10,500 BC, if you go back 12 and a half thousand years, the match between sky and ground uh, is perfect on the spring equinox. <laughs> is this a coincidence or is something extraordinary going on? Are we being told something of great importance? Look, the idea that um, we would use the star field and the phenomenon of precession to date a large monument, to impose a date on a monument, is something we do in our culture today. It shouldn't be such an alien idea to us, because actually it was done at the Hoover Dam. And I have to say, who gives a damn <laughs> where Hoover Dam was built? But Oscar Hansen, the architect and artist who was responsible for the star map uh, set into the floor of the monument, believed that in remote ages to come, intelligent people with knowledge of precession would be able to discern the astronomical time of the dam's dedication. He didn't feel it was good enough to pass it down in a written document. Who could say in 10,000 years whether anybody would be able to read that document, or even if it would survive? What you need is a universal language, and that is the language provided by stars and by monumental architecture, and you can use that to define a date. So stamped on the Hoover Dam is a freezing of the skies above the Hoover Dam at the time the dam was completed. We do it in our time. Why is it strange to imagine that it's done in ancient times? Here's the three great pyramids of Giza. Ankara, Afre, Khufu are the pharaohs to which they are attributed. And this is uh, the uncompleted top of the Great Pyramid. We actually don't know if it was uncompleted or if the earthquake that removed the facing stones that once covered the Great Pyramid also removed some of the top uh, of the Great Pyramid. There's about half a course of masonry uh, on the south side. Should you wish to climb the Great Pyramid illegally, um, because you can't climb it legally these days, um, should you wish to climb it illegally, that's the corner to go up. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the southwest corner, and it gives you a lovely clear line. And if you're reasonably fit, you can do it in about 25 to 30 minutes. Um, there was a, a, an Egyptian gentleman whose nickname was Champion, uh, who in the days when it was um, open for anybody to climb it, uh, used to do it in 11 minutes. Uh, he actually ran up the Great Pyramid. I knew he was an amazing character. Um, Sometimes that I have climbed the Great Pyramid five times, uh, three times illegally, twice with permission. Um, and there I am on the top of the Great Pyramid. And I did tell the, uh, that's the second pyramid behind me. Um, I did tell the story of those who have heard it asked before, but I'm just going to tell it again. That's where I found Grandpa's graffiti. Just one step down, my grandfather, P. Hancock, 5th of April, 1960. Uh, and I did check with my dad. I got him to read my grandfather's diaries. I asked him what it said for the 5th of April, 1916. And he said, find great pyramid today. So I'm sure my grandfather was that babble who <laughs> carved his name amongst hundreds, thousands of other names uh, on top of the great pyramid. So, I'm going to unpack this in more detail later. I think it's very important to pay tribute to the work of others that have brought, I'm, I'm not alone, I work with colleagues and friends in this field, we, are, we all cooperate together, and this fundamental breakthrough on the understanding of the sky over Giza is the work of my dear friend and colleague Robert Bavar, the author of the Orion Mystery, where the stars of Orion spelt, and by the way, Orion was a highly significant constellation to the ancient Egyptians. It wasn't just any old star group. Orion was the god Osiris in the sky. The civilization bringer to ancient Egypt was Osiris. What we appear to have is a map of this region of the sky, which is the region of the sky for the epoch between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, brought down to Earth at Giza, with the Sphinx looking at its counterpart, the constellation of Leo, rising against the background of the, the, the sun in the spring equinox and the constellation of Orion lying due south on the meridian at the moment the sun breaks the horizon in the pattern of the three stars on the ground. It's the sky, and even the Milky Way is represented by the Nile. I'm not saying that the ancient Egyptians or whoever made this uh, put the Nile there, um, but uh, I am saying that the site was chosen uh, because it was uh, a site around which it was possible to create this gigantic 
Skygram diagram. I will go into greater depth in that diagram later as we get further into the talk. Um, but let's go to the Milky Way now. Uh, the Milky Way is our galaxy. It's our home galaxy. We belong there. And uh, it's interesting that um, at the center of the Milky Way galaxy um, is a, what's called the galactic bulge. And there's a theory that there's a huge black hole there as well. Uh, and the whole thing is in circulation around the center of the galaxy. Here's our sun <coughs> towing the solar system with it and the Earth going on a gigantic orbit of hundreds of millions of years around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and that orbit is not uh, always in the plane of the galaxy. Uh, our sun and our solar system behave a bit like a dolphin or a school of dolphins. And they, they rise up and down through the plane of the galaxy, roughly 30 million years ago. And when we pass through the plane of the galaxy, there's certain gravitational density there. And that can have disturbing effects on the population of comets that come into the inner solar system. There are two primary sources of comets. So the Kuiper belt is nearer. The Oort cloud is further away. They are both affected by these gravitational disturbances. And suddenly, comets that are in safe and stable and comfortable orbits uh, find themselves flung into dangerous and risky orbits that cross the orbit of the Earth uh, in the solar system, in the center of the solar system. And astronomers have got pretty good at working out where comets come from because of their, the angle of their approach, whether they come from the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud. Comets are not just dirty snowballs. Comets are serious business. Uh, this is um, comet uh, 67P. This is its rocky nucleus, uh, photographed by the Rosetta probe and landed on by the Philae lander. A giant comet can exceed 200 kilometers in diameter. If we scale this relatively small five to six kilometer comet up to, say, 30 kilometers in diameter, uh, this is what it would look like over the city of Los Angeles. No means a dirty snowball. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the extinction of the dinosaurs. The um, extinction of the dinosaurs occurred 65 to 66 million years ago. And uh, it is now uh, fully accepted that the extinction of the dinosaurs was caused by a cosmic impact, either an asteroid or a comet, hit the Earth, traveling in hot and fast. It was about six miles wide, about 10 kilometers in diameter. And uh, it created, caused a global cataclysm, which resulted in the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, the discovery of this cataclysm took some time. Uh, I'm going to still use the old terminology, but it's called the KT event. These days, geologists have renamed it as the Cretaceous Paleogene event, but let's not bother with that. Let's just call it the, the KT, the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary. And at the, that boundary is found a layer, a distinct layer in the soil. Uh, and that is a layer of ash and soot. And it's filled with the characteristic chemical indications of a colossal cosmic impact. And these impact proxies, as they're called, they include iridium, they include carbon microspherules, they include nanodiamonds, they include shock quartz, they include melt glass, similar to the trinitite that was created in nuclear explosions, um, and other minerals that have been melted at just colossal temperatures. Temperatures above the boiling point of quartz, temperatures in excess of 2,000 degrees centigrade across a wide area uh, of the Earth's surface. Now, it was Lewis and Walter Alvarez who made the discovery uh, of, the, they were the original discoverers, the original people who proposed that it had been a cosmic impact that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And they were absolutely sure of that on the basis of the impact proxies alone. Nothing else would explain it. But they suffered more than 10 years of abuse and attacks from their colleagues who said, no, it's impossible. A cosmic impact could not have done this. There must be some other explanation for the impact proxy. It was only when the crater was discovered, deeply buried beneath the Gulf of Mexico, that finally the opposition went away. And since then, everybody has accepted that it was a cosmic impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. And new evidence is suggesting very strongly that it was, in fact, a comet, uh, not an asteroid. 
that was involved. There's certain chemical reasons for that. Um, so, yes, uh, it changed the world, actually. Uh, if dinosaurs survived at all, their line has survived in, in birds. So, so this was an event that was on such an enormous scale that we can say, perhaps facetiously, that it turned dinosaurs into chickens. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, skulking around in the primeval jungles was this little shrew-like creature, the ancestor of the mammalian line. We mammals were going nowhere when dinosaurs ruled the earth. But when dinosaurs were swept out of the way, the mammalian line took off. And, uh, well, meet your 65-million-year-old uh, mother. Uh, we are all the descendants of that shrew, which um, expanded to fill niches that became available, evolution took place, and uh, 65 million years later, here we are. NASA, of course, has taken on board the KT event. And what they tell us uh, is that such things, such world-changing events caused by cosmic impacts, only happen once every 100 million years. How nice of the universe, to be so Germanic in its height that we can actually set our clock by it. And if it's 100 million year intervals, we do not need to worry. Not going to touch the story of human history, because it's 65 million years ago before there was any human civilization. And it's not going to affect us or the generations to come, because we won't see another impact for another 35 million years. Effectively, we can forget about it. That is not the view uh, of uh, a major group of astronomers who completely uh, disagree with NASA on this. Um, and uh, they include Chandra Wickham Singh, the late Sir Fred Hoyle, they include Phil Napier uh, and, and others. Um, and since the 1980s, they've warned that our cosmic environment may be much more active than NASA believes. Uh, and their concern is specifically with comets. They point out that there is not a single culture in the ancient world where the arrival of a comet in the sky was regarded as good news. The arrival of comets in the sky were always regarded as bad news, associated with cataclysm and death and disaster. Um, but here are NASA trying to calm us down. Uh, they're telling us what a meteor shower is. We've all seen meteors, and uh, they're very familiar objects. Every single meteor that you see, every shooting star, is the remnant of a former comet, a comet that has disintegrated and broken up into multiple parts, and that's the point that they're making here. Uh, and they're saying that the meteoroids are usually small, from dust to boulder size, they're almost always small enough to quickly burn up in their atmosphere, so there's little chance any of them will strike the Earth's surface, but there's a good chance that you can see a beautiful shooting star show in the middle of the night. Very comfortable, very calm. Here's what happens when a comet hits a planet, and when a comet breaks up into multiple parts. Those of us who were watching TV in the 1990s uh, will remember the encounter of Comet shoemaker levy 9 with the planet Jupiter in 1994. Uh, and it did what all comets do, it broke up into multiple fragments, actually more than 20 of them. And uh, NASA was able to photograph the outcome as they were drawn down by the colossal gravity of Jupiter. And the total explosive power this, by the way, this explosion is larger than the Earth. The total explosive power of the Shoemaker-Levy 9 impacts was 300 gigatons. A gigaton is equivalent to 1 billion tons of TNT. The stockpiled nuclear arsenal of the entire Earth, were it to explode at once, would be equivalent to just 6.4 gigatons. And uh, this is always the moment when I say, thank you, Jupiter. <laughs> thank you for being the giant guardian of our planet. Thank you for your vast gravity and your huge orbit in the outer solar system, drawing in the comets that would otherwise have wiped out and made life on Earth completely impossible. Jupiter is our guardian and our protector, but occasionally a, a comet gets through. And uh, in this paper, published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, Bill Napier is drawing attention to the remnant the remnants, the debris field of a particular comet. And that is what is called the torrid complex, the torrid meteor sweep, which the Earth passes through twice a year. And he's saying the evidence decades old now, not even controversial amongst the comet community, is that an exceptionally large 
Low inclination, short period comet has been orbiting in our neighborhood for about 20,000 years and disintegrating. And in such a disintegrating environment, there's a reasonable probability of a catastrophic encounter with debris in the comet trail. They believe that such catastrophic encounters with the debris from the original giant comet that made up the Taurid meteor stream uh, have occurred several times in the past 13,000 years and have had a profound, though as yet unrecognized, effects uh, on the course of human history. So these are, the, the Taurid meteor stream is called the Taurid meteor stream because it appears to come at us from the direction of the constellation of Taurus. Uh, in fact, that's an, that's an optical illusion. These comets are not coming from the constellation of Taurus at all, but they're coming from the bit of the sky in which we observe the constellation of Taurus. There, the constellation of Taurus is incredibly far away. These comet fragments are incredibly close. Um, and we pass through it uh, twice a year. Uh, we pass through it in June uh, for about 12 days, and we pass through it again at the beginning of uh, November. Uh, and the most uh, recent uh, impact that we have had out of the Taurid meteor field, with meteor stream which is documented, uh, happened in 1908. It happened on the 30th of June 1908 at the peak of the Beta Taurids, uh, and it happened fortunately over an uninhabited area of Siberia. Uh, the object was not actually very large, it was a smallish bit of the comet, so between 60 and 190 meters in diameter. It didn't hit the ground, it burst in the air several kilometers above the ground, but the effects were stunning. It flattened 80 million trees across more than 2,000 square kilometers. That's an area larger than Greater London uh, in England. If this had happened over a city, we would all be very alert to the dangers of the Torrid Meteor Street. But it passed almost without notice. It wasn't really fully documented until many, many years later. So this is a, a graphic giving you a sense of what the Torrid meteor stream uh, looks like. Um, it includes, we already know, a number of large objects like Comet Enki. Comet Enki is a fragment of the original giant comet, and it's a pretty substantial uh, fragment. Um, and Comet Boldiato, Comet Rudniki, 19 of the brightest near-Earth objects are in the Torrid meteor stream, plus lots and lots of other stuff that hasn't been documented but we know from calculations is that uh, the Earth passes through the Torrid meteor stream twice a year. Uh, we proceed at the rate of um, 2.5 million kilometers a day on our orbital path. It takes us 12 days to pass through the Torrid meteor stream because it's 30 million kilometers wide. And it's filled with filaments of debris, some of which are very large and heavy, some of which are very small and indeed just give rise to shooting stars. While the astronomers have been looking at the sky at the Torrid meteor stream, another team of scientists, more than 30 of them, geologists, geophysicists, have been looking at the Earth. They are led by James Kennett, who's a marine geologist, professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm showing a number of the other scientists in the group, Alan West, Richard Firestone, <coughs> James Whitkett, Albert Goodyear. They've been actually publishing their findings in peer-reviewed press since 2007, but knowledge of this has not filtered out a great deal uh, to the general public. To understand why they got into this, um, we need to just say a word or two about the last ice age, because they were intrigued by a mystery of the last ice age, and they wanted to explain it. That's how they got into this research. Not because they were looking at the heavens, because they were trying to explain something that happened. The last glacial maximum was 21,300 years ago. Then we had these just massive ice caps about two or three miles deep sitting on top of North America and on top of Northern Europe. Sea level was 400 feet lower then because all the rain that had fallen froze onto the ice caps and did not return to the sea. 400 feet lower. 27 million square kilometers of land that were above the water then are underwater now. Indonesia, massive land mass joined to Southeast Asia. Uh, Australia joined to New Guinea. Uh, Sri Lanka joined to India, no Red Sea, no Persian Gulf, and so on and so forth. A very different world. After 21,300 years ago, the world began to warm up. And the warming was quite polite, and quite gradual, until this happened. 12,800 years ago, a radical plunge in temperature, which lasts for 1,200 years. Geologists have known about this radical plunge in temperature that took the Earth back to the coldest it was at the coldest of the Ice Age. 
It's referred to as the younger dryas after the type species of alpine flower that flourished in those conditions. Um, and it's always been a mystery about why it happened, because it started suddenly, and the beginning was accompanied by massive global flooding, and it ended suddenly 11,600 years ago, and that was accompanied by massive global flooding as well. What could explain this phenomenon? And why was it accompanied by massive, large-scale animal extinctions? Uh, if you look at the late Pleistocene mortality graph, you see a huge cluster around 12,800 years ago, around the Younger Dryas period. We lost a lot of the megafauna uh, at that time. Um, and uh, it's now clear that the epicenter of the cataclysm was in North America, uh, but that uh, it was worldwide in extent. It was just the worst of it. The, the absolute peak of the disaster, the epicenter, was in North America. Why would that be? Well, that group of Earth scientists, more than 30 of them, who I just showed you, set out to solve this problem. And lo and behold, they found a lair in the soil dated to 12,800 years ago. Initially, they thought it was 12,900 years ago. They've managed to refine the date down, and they're very sure that we're looking at 12,800 years ago. And that layer in the soil is exactly like the layer in the soil that we find with the extinction of the dinosaurs. It's filled with exactly the same impact proxies, the carbon microspherules, the nanodiamonds, the trinitite, and so on and so forth. Um, and they began to realize just as Lewis and Walter Alvarez had realized before, that they were dealing with a cosmic impact. Nothing else will explain the abundances of these proxies. And this layer, they call it the black mat, which is filled with soot, which testifies to wildfires, continent wild, wide wildfires burning. So how is that all of this to be explained? The answer is a cosmic impact. And here's the first paper they published uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 9th October 2007. I don't expect you to read it, but there's the headline, Evidence for an Extraterrestrial Impact 12,900 Years Ago that Contributed to the Megafaunal Extinctions and the Younger Dryas Cooling. This was the first time that the idea was put forward. Um, then we have uh, another paper in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a couple of years later, Shock Synthesized Hexagonal Diamonds in Younger Dryas Boundary Service. So then a whole raft of papers very high temperature impact melt products as evidence of cosmic air bursts and impacts 12,900 years ago. Evidence from central Mexico, evidence from the Greenland ice cores, evidence for deposition of 10 million tons of impact ferules across four continents 12,800 years ago. As I say, the date has been refined down to 12,800 years ago. <coughs> Journal of Geology, uh, 5th of September 2014. Nano diamond rich layer across three continents consistent with major cosmic impact at 12,800 years before the present. Uh, a paper from 2015, a Bayesian uh, analysis, it's, it's a statistical procedure. I will not go or even attempt <laughs> to explain it here, but it was done in order to understand, were these impact proxies, is it possible that they, they were laid down gradually, uh, or were they laid down in a single <coughs> And the conclusion of the research is that they were laid down in a single event, and that single event effectively unfolded in a single terrible day and night, a 24-hour period. It appears that the fragments, the comet fragments falling out of the Taurid meteor stream, of course, leaving many more still in orbit, but at least four of them impacted the North American ice cap. The objects came in roughly on this trajectory, uh, they left devastation in North America. Further fragments undoubtedly impacted in Northern Europe. We find evidence for that there. And the furthest east that they've documented evidence for these comet impacts is in Syria, in fact. And we're looking at uh, 50 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface. And I'm in regular touch with these scientists, and they say they've now, now found evidence for impacts even further east. A truly global event took place. Um, the evidence that the Younger Dryas global cataclysm was caused by multiple comet fragments hitting the Earth, with the primary impacts and epicenter of the disaster being on the North American ice cap, it's now, in, in my opinion, overwhelming. Nevertheless, please bear in mind that the group of more than 30 scientists involved have faced huge opposition to their findings, just as Lewis and Walker Alvarez faced opposition to theirs. And they've never received any official funding for their work. They funded it all out of their own pockets. 
some of their peers who are invested in outdated models regard them as heretics. And such opposition to radical new hypotheses is common in science. But I urge you to treat with the utmost skepticism any claim by ideological opponents to the effect that the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis has been disproved. This is not at all the case. I review the whole controversy in depth in chapter five of Magicians of the Gods. The scientists behind the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis have recently created a formal consortium called the Comet Research Group. And just a week ago, they launched a crowdfunding appeal. Uh, if anybody feels like parting with $5, please go to that crowdfunding field and donate. You can find the banner for the Comet Research Group on my website. It's quite prominent there. I also link to it in my most recent blog. Uh, and that will also link you to a huge amount of science behind the Younger Dryas impacts if you want to investigate it. Recently um, has been found a number of craters that appear to have been left by those impacts. You see, the majority of the impacts were on the North American ice cap, which was miles deep, and it absorbed most of the effects, leaving not many craters. But craters have been found, and the crowdfunding appeal in the last week has raised enough money for the Younger Dryas researchers to go and investigate the Corosol crater, where preliminary evidence indicates that it was created 12,800 years ago, that it is an impact crater of those events. So as I say, the primary impacts were on the North American ice cap. Uh, it was still more than two kilometers deep 12,800 years ago. The impact proxies are all over the world. But if we go south of the ice cap, we can see evidence for the disastrous flood that unfolded. Um, actually, nobody disputes that the Channel Scablands of the Pacific Northwest of the United States were shaped by uh, immense floods 12,800 years ago. And it's agreed that these floods were anomalous because they occurred at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. Uh, and that's a period of intense global cooling. We would expect the flooding to be accompanied by, by a warming phase, uh, but this was not the case. So why do we have this massive flooding uh, across the channel scablands of the Pacific Northwest? I'd like to pay tribute to J. Harlan Brent. Uh, he was the field geologist back in the early 1900s who walked the walk for decades all over the Channel Scablands, and who realized before anybody else that a massive flood, he described it as the single greatest flood in the entire history of the Earth, had occurred across the Channel Scablands. And um, he, of course, for suggesting that, was attacked by all his colleagues. Scientists, geologists, want to separate themselves off from anything that smacks of biblical superstition. And it sounded like he was talking about the flood of Noah. Uh, and that was a bad idea when they were trying to make themselves apparent as hard scientists. So J. Harlan Bretz came in for a terrible amount of criticism. He was isolated. His colleagues would not speak to him. They said insulting and humiliating things about him. But he was right. And in 1979, after spending half his life as a geological pariah, he was awarded the Penrose Medal of the Geological Society of America, the most prestigious award in the field of geology. He was 96 years old at the time. After receiving the award, he reportedly told his son, all my enemies are dead, so I have no one to gloat over. <laughs> he had to compromise. Bretz was always of the view, and he remained of that view to the end of his days, that we were dealing with a single giant flood that had risen and fallen within a period of three weeks. Mainstream geology would not accept that, but an alternative was proposed that would account, perhaps, for the features seen on the ground, uh, and that would fit into a more gradualist, less cataclysmic model. And that alternative involves something called Glacial Lake Missoula. The Glacial Lake, held in by an ice dam, when the ice dam breaks, the lake spills out and uh, creates all this damage. Well, obviously, the damage is much more extensive than the lake, so geologists have invoked not one flood, but dozens of floods. Some of them are even invoking 80 floods over a period of 2,000 years to account for the damage that we see on the ground. And J. Harlan Brett reluctantly said, oh, you see, the problem was that they were saying, when they criticized him, they were saying, what's the source of the water? And he said, that's not my problem. 
I see flooding, evidence of flooding on the ground. You've got to figure out what the source of the water is. And this provided a kind of source to the water. But I think if J. Harlan Bretz had been aware of the latest evidence of Compton Acts 12,800 years ago, uh, if he had lived to see the evidence that the North American ice cap was hit 12,800 years ago by several large fragments of the Younger Dryas Comet, I don't think he would have gone to Glacial Lake Missoula at all. He would have returned to the original conclusion of his field research that there had been a single humongous flood. And the comet provides the hitherto missing heat source to account for the sudden melting of a sufficiently vast area uh, of the ice cap. And uh, we see this. I was recently on the Joe Rogan show with uh, Randall Carlson, great catastrophist researcher. Uh, and Randall and I did a big field trip across North America with, with Santa um, back in 2014. This is Dry Falls in Washington State. It's a fossilized waterfall. Uh, and it's the, the typical sort of horseshoe shape. There's a blade that runs down the middle and then a second bit here. It's very, very large. Okay. Let's have a look at uh, Dry Falls. Um, I'm standing there with Randall Carlson. And this is Dry Falls uh, in the background. We're only seeing a couple of its lobes. It continues all the way around here. For scale, let's put Niagara Falls into the picture. Niagara Falls is really tiny by comparison with Dry Falls. And Niagara Falls is the work of 12,000 years, 12,000 years work of the river. Uh, in the case of Dry Falls, the evidence is compelling that it was created in just three weeks. And it was created because of that huge flood that came off the ice cap. And that was not just a flood of water. That was a hugely abrasive flood, filled with forests that had been ripped up by their roots, filled with boulders rumbling and rolling in the face of the flood, and just densely packed with icebergs that had come off the ice cap. This is the erosive agent that created dry falls in an incredibly short period of time and left it as a fossilized waterfall uh, ever since when the water flow stopped. Um, up here above Wenatchee in Washington State, we find this huge boulder sitting on the side of the valley, about 500 feet above the valley floor. Let's take a closer look. I'm there with Ravel Carlson in front of the boulder, and uh, there I am on top of the boulder calculated to weigh 18,000 tons. It came from about 100 kilometers away. How did it get there? It got there in an iceberg the size of an oil tanker, which was carried on that flood. And when the iceberg grounded against the valley side, 500 feet above the valley floor, it stuck, the ice melted away, and the boulder that it had enchained, because glaciers do this all the time, they enchain boulders, the boulder that it had enchained was dropped on the valley side. And don't imagine that that one above Wenatchee is on its own. Uh, they are all over the landscape of the Pacific Northwest, these 10 to 20,000 ton boulders carried there in icebergs. Uh, this is even called Boulder Park. Uh, it's an amazing area to go and visit, and you get the sense of the truly cataclysmic forces that uh, lay behind it. Um, nature is fractal. Uh, this is what we see on a beach when the tide goes out. These are called current ripples. I think we're all familiar with current ripples on the beach. They're about an inch high. But if you go to the Camas Prairie in Washington State, you can find current ripples that extend across the landscape and are much more than an inch high. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, those current ripples are about 50 feet high and 300 feet long. You can see here a vehicle for scale, what we're dealing with. Those were created by the receding floodwaters of the event from 12,800 years ago. Why did the world suddenly get cold then? The flooding didn't only go south across North America, but it also went into the world ocean, and of particular interest into the Atlantic Ocean, where it stopped the Gulf Stream dead in its tracks. That flood of icy meltwater pouring into the Atlantic Ocean interrupted the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream is part of the global meridional overturning circulation of our planet that keeps our planet warm. So when you stop the Gulf Stream, as happened then, and it stayed stopped for 1,200 years, you get a radical plunge in temperature. And that's what happened at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. 
As to the end of the Yoga Dryas, 11,600 years ago, um, we're less certain about what was involved. But as early as the 1980s, Sir Fred Hoyle, who was a professor of astronomy at Cambridge University, proposed that the oceanic impact of a comet or a comet fragment would be the most likely cause of the sudden and otherwise mysterious global warming at the end of the Younger Dryas. Why? Because a comet fragment hitting an ocean would put up a huge cloud of water vapor into the upper atmosphere, as well as creating giant tidal waves, a huge cloud of water vapor into the upper atmosphere, enshrouding the Earth, creating the greenhouse effect that accounts for the radical warming at the end of the Younger Dryas. Uh, and in fact, the recent science, uh, they're beginning to accept uh, this is, this, this is uh, comet impact may have triggered Earth's ancient warming period, not the ancient warming period of 11,600 years ago, but actually 56 million years ago. There's evidence for a massive comet impact and a global cataclysm 56 million years ago. And that in itself gives the lie to NASA's notions that these big events only occur every 100 million years, because that was just 9 million years after the KT event. Um, the science of what caused the end of the Younger Dryas is not nearly so well documented as the science on the beginning of the Younger Dryas. Whatever the agency, however, and I'm open to the notion that solar activity was involved, that solar flares may have been involved in the raising of temperatures at the end of the Younger Dryas. Whatever the agency, what is sure is that the Younger Dryas did end abruptly 11,600 years ago. Global temperatures soared. And the remaining ice caps very rapidly collapsed into the sea. And when they did so, they caused a dramatic pulse of sea level rise, which geologists are very well aware of, and which they call Meltwater Pulse 1B. And it occurred 11,600 years ago, exactly at the end of the Younger Dryas. Interestingly enough, 11,600 years ago is Plato's date for the destruction and submergence of the great lost civilization of Atlantis. Plato tells us a lot about Atlantis. Uh, by the way, Plato is the sole original source that has survived for the story of Atlantis. Every other reference to Atlantis is secondary to Plato. Plato tells us that Atlantis had advanced architecture, advanced agriculture, advanced navigational shipbuilding and seagoing skills, advanced social and political organization. Uh, he tells us that uh, Atlantis was once a, a beautiful culture, dedicated to the nurture of spirit, but that as time went by, it became cruel, it became arrogant, it became corrupt. It began to impose its power upon other less developed cultures around the world, it became excessively materialistic. And in a ringing phrase, it ceased to carry its prosperity with moderation. The Greeks had a notion of hubris and nemesis, that if one uh, takes on the attitude of hubris, of arrogant self-pride, one will be punished with nemesis. And the suggestion is that Atlantis was slapped down because of its hubris, because it ceased to carry its prosperity with Moderation. Interestingly, the account is prefaced with uh, uh, an account of a celestial cataclysm, a variation in the course of the heavenly bodies, described by Plato as a mythical version of the truth. And we learn from Plato that in a single dreadful day and night, Atlantis was swallowed up by the sea and vanished. And mankind had to begin again like children, with no memory of what went before. It's also interesting that Plato tells us that at the time of Atlantis, the advanced civilization of Atlantis coexisted with hunter-gatherer civilization. Uh, and he tells us that it was those hunter-gatherer civilizations, which he refers to as the unlettered and the uncultured, who for some reason survived the cataclysm, not the Atlanteans, not the advanced civilization of Atlantis. I'll come back to the implications of that later. And the date, Plato got the story through his family line from the Greek lawmaker Solon, who had visited Egypt in 600 BC and uh, effectively interviewed the priests at the Temple of Sight in the Delta, where there were inscriptions written on the wall. That temple no, no longer stands. And those inscriptions referred, the priests said, to the destruction of the great civilization of Atlantis. They, in other words, it was the Egyptians who passed on the story of Atlantis to the Greeks, to Solon, and that way it reached Plato. So Solon asked the Egyptian priests, when was Atlantis swallowed up by the sea? When did it vanish? And they replied, 9,000 years ago. 
That was in 600 BC. 9,600 BC is 11,600 years ago, give or take it 10 years or so. In our time frame, 11,600 years ago is meltwater pulse 1b. So although Plato and anybody who even dares to speak of Atlantis is accused of frauds and pseudoscience and fantasies by the archaeological hierarchy, uh, Plato's date for the destruction and submergence of Atlantis coincides exactly with the date of Meltwater Pulse 1B, long recognized as a global cataclysm flooding event. He was right on the money, and I don't think he was fantasizing at all. Of course, the Egyptologists say that you can't find a single reference to Atlantis in the ancient Egyptian text. And that's true. There isn't the word Atlantis in any ancient Egyptian text. But is there a reference to a former advanced people uh, who lived on an island who were destroyed in a flooding cataclysm? Yes, absolutely there is. And that reference is found on the walls of the Temple of Horus at Edfu in Upper Egypt. Uh, this temple is not very old. It's a Ptolemaic temple, dates to about the 300s BC. Um, but it was built on the site of an older temple that had become decrepit and needed to be replaced. Turns out that older temple was built on the site of an even older temple. In other words, this is just the latest incarnation of a series of temples. And the priests of Edfu inherited the archives of the former temples. And amongst those archives were documents written on animal skins. They tell us this. Written on animal skins which were falling apart, crumbling, fragile. And they decided that the information in them was so important that they would preserve it forever. So what they did was they took extracts and they carved them deeply into the walls of the Temple of Horus at Edfu. Uh, and most of them are found between the inner and outer enclosure walls. They're called the Edfu building texts. Uh, and this is what they look like. And the story that they tell is of a homeland of the primeval ones, an island that was destroyed in a great flood. And they tell how the primeval ones, the gods, came to Egypt and established religion by building primeval mounds up and down the land made very clear that they set out the blueprint upon which all future temples and pyramids would be built in Egypt. Um, and and uh, a snake called the Great Leaping One is described as the source of this disaster. And that's interesting because comets in many ancient cultures are referred to as serpents, cosmic serpents, snakes, that kind of thing. Uh, and and uh, his assault causes the homeland of the primeval ones to be swallowed up by the sea, but first the island was pierced and the domain was split. We learn from the entry texts that the sacred island of the gods was utterly destroyed. All that was left in the ocean was mud. And that's interesting because Plato says exactly the same thing about Atlantis. When it went down, all that was left was mud, so thick that that part of the ocean was no longer navigable for a very long period of time. The entry texts tell us that there were survivors, and that those survivors set about wandering the world particular word for this, by sea. Uh, and their project was to reincarnate, to bring back to life again the former world of the gods. They were attempting to restart the civilization that they had lost. And one of the places that I believe they went to, not so far from Egypt actually, was Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. And I'll talk a bit about Gobekli Tepe now, because it is the most important archaeological site in the world, in my view. And interestingly enough, it dates to 11,600 years ago. And archaeologists are now scrambling to catch up with this. And they're telling us that something amazing happened at Gobekli Tepe 11,600 years ago. Those hunter-gatherers, there's no evidence for anything other than hunter-gatherer peoples in that area before 11,600 years ago, they woke up one morning and they invented megalithic architecture, and they invented agriculture as well. Let's think about that. Oh, the, yeah, my book, Fingerprints of the Gods, the central message of this book was that civilization is older and more mysterious than we thought. I, I came in for a lot of attacks from that. One of the magazines that most frequently attacked me was New Scientist, who accused me of being a pseudoscientist, and it was absolute nonsense that archaeologists knew how old civilization was. Of course, it couldn't be thousands of years older. So I was very pleased in 2013 when New Society published this headline. <laughs> the true dawn, civilization is older and more mysterious than we thought. Well, <laughs> they, they, were, 
They were obliged to, to publish that because of Gobekli Tepe. They've got to get to grips with Gobekli Tepe. And why? Well, here's the problem. This is megalithic architecture as we know it. This is Stonehenge, okay? Stonehenge is 7,000 years younger than Gobekli Tepe. And Gobekli Tepe is much bigger than Stonehenge. And it turns out much more sophisticated. Now, in the case of Stonehenge, we understand how it happened. That was a, this is the Neolithic. Uh, this is an agricultural community. They're not hunter-gatherers. They're generating surpluses. Those surpluses allow specialists to emerge, engineers, architects, astronomers, who can do the astronomical setting up and who can quarry the stone and cut it and arrange all the moving and the site planning and the organization of labor. All of that fits with what we know about Neolithic agricultural societies. They have the surplus uh, to uh, allow this to happen. But how do we account for something much bigger than Stonehenge, much more sophisticated, which is 7,000 years older, in an area that was entirely populated by hunter-gatherers before Gobekli Tepe is created? How do we account for that? I mean, and they, it's a sort of fairy tale that the archaeologists are giving us. They're, they're, really, they're really saying this, that a group of hunter-gatherers woke up one morning with fully equipped with all the knowledge and all the skills and all the organizational abilities and all the surplus to create the largest megalithic site that's ever been seen on Earth. Uh, and just as a sideline, they invented agriculture as well. Because it turns out that that's when agriculture begins to spread all over Turkey and they, they, they move into the, the Neolithic phase. Uh, this seems to be uh, completely nonsensical. Let's. Uh, Look at a few aspects of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, that's, a, that's an overview of one of the main parts of the excavation, where we see these circles and these characteristic T-shaped pillars, megalithic pillars. Um, some of them are truly on a superhuman scale. Uh, many of them contain amazing carvings, uh, high relief, uh, very interesting information. I don't have time to go into what I think this stele is all about, but. These objects on the top of it are of great interest. Um, and here I am with Klaus Schmidt, who is the excavator, the discoverer of uh, Gobekli Tepe. Let me tell you that with uh, megalithic sites, there is a problem with dating. We don't have a technique for dating stone. We, uh, we, what we do is we carbon date organic material that is found in association with the stone. And you want that organic material to be in such close association with the stone that you can deduce that the stone was placed there at the same time the organic material got there. Then you arrive at your date. But uh, it is open to the possibility of the intrusion of younger organic material. If a site has been open, if many cultures have been over it, then you get the possibility of younger organic material being intruded, and the date is falsely young, when the site may be much older than that. This doesn't happen at Gobekli Tepe. I'll tell you why. Klaushnik is pointing vehemently at the ground, because he is telling me by the way, Klaus passed away in 2014. Um, he gave me three days of his time and really showed me around. What he's telling me here is that this stuff, this stuff, isn't natural sedimentation. Gobekli Tepe was deliberately buried. The site was used for about a thousand years. He regards it as a center of innovation. That was indeed where the agricultural skills were taught. And then it was decommissioned and it was closed down. And teams of people came with buckets filled with stones and earth, and they just filled up the stone circles, and they covered them up, and they covered them up, and they went on, and they actually created a hill over the top of the site, completely sealing it. That's what Gobekli Tepe means in the Turkish language. It means pot-bellied hill. Uh, and there, after sealing it, it remained sealed and untouched, unknown to any later culture for more than 10,000 years until Klaus Schmidt began the excavations, found it, I, I won't go into the extraordinary story of how it was found, found it and began to excavate and discovered that he's dealing with an 11,600 years ago massive megalithic site, because the other thing he's telling me here is that so far they have only excavated 1 50th of the total area of Gobekli Tepe. They've been over the whole site with ground penetrating radar and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of huge megalithic pillars still under the ground, still grouped in stone so Goodness knows what else this site is going to have to teach. Uh, so uh, 
Long story short, I, I don't think we're dealing with a sudden, mysteriously precocious invention 7,000 years ahead of its time. Uh, I think we're looking at a transfer of technology uh, from the survivors of a lost civilization who already knew how to work megaliths on a grand scale and who already fully understood agriculture and who settled amongst the hunter-gatherers of Turkey and transferred their skills to them, attempting to rebuild or restart the former world of the gods. Actually, Gobekli Tepe is not alone. This is a site called Karahan Tepe, where we can see the same T-shaped pillars sticking out of the ground. The preliminary investigation indicates that it's of the same age as Gobekli Tepe, but it's just in some farmer's backyard. It hasn't been properly excavated yet. Uh, something else uh, interesting, Gobekli Tepe lies between the headwaters of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Uh, the two rivers of Mesopotamia, that's what Mesopotamia means, between two rivers, and therefore we must consider the Sumerian culture uh, and the whole explosion of civilization that occurred there five or six thousand years ago. So it's interesting that uh, on Sumerian objects, Madeleine Danes, a researcher in the Cuneiform Digital Library, can you see what I'm seeing here? Can you see the T-shaped pillar? I'll outline it. That's the top of the T, and that's the pillar, the pillar, top of the T, and the suggestion of a circle surrounding it. Pillar, T-shape, pillar, T-shape, and there's another group of them uh, over here. Now, this is found on a piece of pottery from the Uruk 5 period, dated to 3500 to 3350 BC. We know Gobekli Tepe was fully buried at that time. Uh, it suggests that um, other uh, sites of that type had continued to be used. These images raise the possibility that other such centers remained in operation and were still being revered by the Sumerians thousands of years later. And that brings me to Oannes and the seven sages, the Apkalu of ancient Mesopotamia, the bringers of civilization who wear fishes on their heads uh, and carry these cute little man bags. <laughs> Sometimes we even have three-dimensional images of the man bags. The seven sages were remembered as teaching advanced astronomical and geodetic knowledge, including all the skills necessary for planning and setting out a city. Interestingly enough, the same cute little man bag turns up in the hands of the earliest image of Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, an image that was found in a stratum dating to more than 1,500 BC. Exactly the same device held in exactly the same way. And Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, was the civilization bringer to ancient Mexico. Uh, and they turn up on top of pillar 43 in enclosure D at Gobekli Tepe, the same man bag. But there we know that they are more than 11,000 years old. Is this the badge of office of some group of civilizers, the way that they recognize one another, handling and carrying these uh, curious little pouches? I'm going to take you to the city of Haram, Haram uh, in Mesopotamia, very close to Gobekli Tepe. Uh, Haran uh, was known in historical times as the city of a mysterious people called the Sabians. Their image was the crescent moon and the disc. And oddly enough, we find the crescent moon and the disc on the iconography of Gobekli Tepe as well. But Haran uh, dates from more recent times. It dates from the, really the period of Abraham uh, in the Bible, who were the child of Haran. Um, and uh, the Temple of the Moon was its famous um, uh, religious monument, uh, and the Sabian religion continued through into Islamic times. Now, Islam uh, dislikes paganism, and uh, Islam normally presented people it regarded as pagans with a choice, which was either convert to Islam or be killed. They didn't do that with the Sabians. They regarded the Sabians as a people of the book. Sabians had presented a book, which turned out to be the Hermetic text, the text attributed to the god of both, the god of wisdom. Uh, and they allowed uh, so-called pagan worship to continue at Haran right through until about 1300 AD, when finally uh, a ferocious variant of Islam cracked down upon them, and the Sabian system was completely destroyed. The Temple of the Moon was destroyed, and they built this mosque there in the site of the Temple of the Moon. But oddly enough, to this day, the last surviving minaret of that mosque is known as the Astronomical Tower uh, in, in Haran. 
So the Sabians undertook a mysterious annual pilgrimage to Giza. We know this because the Arab geographer Yakut al-Amawi, 1179 to 1229 AD, gives the dimensions of the two largest of the Giza pyramids in his geographical dictionary and adds, to both of them, the Sabians made their pilgrimage. Salim Hassan, a great Egyptologist, saw the significance of this during the course of his excavations at Giza in the 1930s. Quote, now, of course, these Sabians were star worshippers, and if I guess rightly, they had derived their name from the Egyptian word sabah, star. The Sabians were followers of an ancient religion, worshippers of the hosts of heaven, the heavenly bodies. Whatever the origin of their name may have been, the fact remains that they fully recognized the pyramids as being monuments connected with the stellar cult and revered them as places of pilgrimage. So let's think a little bit more about the Sabians. Here is Habit Ibn Tura, one of the famous Sabians. Um, he was known for his trigonometry, his geometry, for his earth measuring, for his astronomy. Uh, and in that, he made frequent use of right triangles, triangles in the dimension of three, four, and five, which contain a right angle, and in a three, four, five right triangle, the acute angle is 36.87 degrees. Keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, I want to just read this statement from Tabit Ibn Kura. Who else have civilized the world and built the cities, if not the nobles and kings of paganism? Who else have set in order the harbors and rivers? And who else have taught the hidden wisdom? To whom else has the deity revealed itself, given oracles? and told about the future, if not the famous men amongst the pagans. The pagans have made known all this. They have discovered the art of healing the soul. They have also made known the art of healing the body. They have filled the earth with settled forms of government and with wisdom, which is the highest good. Without paganism, the world would be empty and miserable. He was a great math mathematician and geometer, and as I mentioned, three, four, five triangles were uh, right triangles were, were crucial to the star worship, as it's called, of the Sabians. So we'll go back to Giza, uh, and we've already talked about the processional numbers at Giza. We remember that the Sabians made an annual pilgrimage to Giza. And let's go to the so-called King's Chamber in the heart of the Great Pyramid. It's a wonderful place for meditation. By the way, meditation is now illegal in the King's Chamber. Of the Great Pyramid. As a matter of fact, if you even go in with bare feet, they're going to throw you out because they think there's a danger you're going to meditate. <laughs> go figure. As well as being a wonderful place for meditation, the Great uh, Pyramid's so called King's Chamber contains a three, four, five right triangle. And it contains it in this form. You take the diagonal from the south wall over to the north wall, you bring it back to the south wall, and you go along here, and you have a three, four, five triangle, 15, 20, and 25 cubits, the right angle, the acute angle, 36.87 degrees. I'm not going to try to unpack why this also encodes precessional numbers. I put it in the writing there, but I realize I'm, I'm running out of time. It's a three, four, five right triangle hidden in the king's chamber that's of particular interest here. <coughs> because it turns out that the latitude of Haram is not random. The latitude of Haram is 36.87 degrees north. That is the acute angle in a right triangle, a 345 right triangle. We know that 345 right triangles were used continuously in the trigonometry of the ancient Sabians. It can't be a coincidence that the site is situated on latitude 36.87 degrees north. And I want to pay tribute to James Q. Jacob, who is the archaeologist and anthropologist, who was the first to notice this, that Haran's latitude is highly significant and it is defined by the 345 right triangle. But then there's something else that J.Q. Jacob picked up, something really extraordinary. It turns out that Quebec Keke is exactly one one thousandth of the Earth's circumference latitude distance north of Haram. And that creates a real conundrum, because we understand why Haram is there. It's a fixed latitude defined by the acute angle in the right triangle. 
But then to find that Gobekli Tepe is exactly one thousandth of the Earth's circumference latitude difference north of Haran suggests an extraordinary possibility. And, and J.Q. Jacobs says it. Even non archaeos understand stratification and deposition basics. Deeper is older. Gobekli Tepe is 12,000 years old. Haran is equated with Ur of Sumeria, the civilized land and a cradle of civilization. That cradle and astronomy is presumed to be 4,000 to 5,000 years old, not 12,000. Haran is located at three over four eight time latitude, a fixed parameter, and Gobekli Tepe is at a specific latitude difference. Because the fixed parameter must come first, the conundrum, of course, is that this precise one one thousandth of circumference latitude difference is either a coincidence or ancient astronomy just took a leap back <laughs> to 12,000 years ago. And I, of course, believe that that is the case. Gobekli Tepe is opening the doors to a complete re-inquiry into the past. This submerged megalithic site has been underwater for more than 9,000 years. We don't know how long it stood there before the rising seas covered it, but before the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, even a 9,000-year-old megalithic site wouldn't have made any sense. Suddenly we know that those ideas were in the world then. Uh, Gobekli Tepe, T-shaped megaliths, the T-shaped megaliths of Menorca in the Balearic Islands in Spain. Menorca is one of those sites where uh, there's a grave danger of intrusion of later organic materials giving both the young dates. I think we have to reconsider the age of the megaliths of Menorca. Uh, the general sort of circular appearance of the Gobekli Tepe uh, circles, very similar to the great megalithic temples of Malta. And again, the dating of the Maltese temples is highly suspect. I think we're going to have to reconsider the ages of all megalithic sites all around the world. If we go to Tiwanaku in Bolivia, we can see that this uh, icon, which we, we would recognize it as a letter H, I'm not saying that that's what it was seen as. This is Gobekli Tepe, okay? These are the, the, the T-shaped pillars of Gobekli Tepe. They actually have arms and hands carved into their sides, and they wear belts, and the belt of this figure has this H-shaped icon. That H-shaped icon is found carved in massive stonework at Tiwanaku in Bolivia on the other side of the world. It could be a coincidence, but it's interesting that that's the case. Here's Tiwanaku. We're looking down on the so-called Akapana pyramid. Here's the Kalasa Sia, and here's the semi-subterranean temple in front of the Kalasa Sia. Uh, we are 14,000 feet above sea level. Uh, the site is 14,000 feet above sea level. Santa and I were 4,000 feet above it in an unpressurized aircraft with the windows open so that Santa could take the picture. Boy, did we have altitude sickness after that. Um, Calasasia. Let's take a closer look. When we look at the Calasasia, we can see that it actually consists of a wall of megaliths joined together in this way. And when we look even closer, we can see it more clearly. There are the megaliths running along, and here's the wall in between them. Turns out that the wall is um, much more recent than the the megaliths, and in fact, it's a, it's a recent reconstruction by archaeologists from stumbled, tumbled stones that were found lying there. This is the original Calasasia, defined by these huge, huge megaliths. Um, just another view of them there. Uh, and again, looking down, this is the so-called gateway of the sun, which plays with sunrise at certain key moments of the year. Um, there we're looking through the gateway of the sun at sunset and at dawn, it's really extraordinary what happens there. But here's the thing. As well as the processional motion, the tilt of the Earth's axis changes over a long period of time, over a 41,000 year cycle. This site was once aligned to the summer solstice sunrise. It isn't today because of the altering obliquity of the ecliptic. You have to go back to the same period, 10,000 BC, roughly 12,000 years ago, to get the site lining up perfectly to the solstice sunrise. Um, in that semi-subterranean temple, there is a pillar with a serpent carved up the side of it and a curious little animal up here, which I'll talk more about in a moment. And on the front of the pillar, we see this heavily bearded figure who is always associated with the god Viracocha, 
who came in a time of darkness after a great flood, bringing civilization to the Andes. I mentioned this small animal. Here we've turned it on its side. You can see it more clearly, and we've outlined it here so that it's unmistakable. And it doesn't look like any known species of animal in the Andes today, but it looks a hell of a lot like Toxodon, which went extinct during the Younger Dryas Cup. Is it possible that Tiwanaku is vastly older than archaeologists believe, not 2,000 years old, but more than 12,000 years old, as its alignment seems to indicate? Uh, the Iracocha, uh, after his civilizing mission in the Andes, his travels took him to Manta, Ecuador, where he crossed the Pacific Ocean, walking on the water. And interestingly, off the coast of Ecuador, uh, where he discovered these man-made columns, deeply, deeply submerged. This research, as far as I know, has never been followed up. There are traditions of a lost homeland in the Pacific, referred to as Heba. Um, and then we come to Easter Island, where those Heba traditions are most strongly maintained. Easter Island was said to be founded by survivors of the lost land of Eva. Um, archaeologists will tell you that the Moai of Easter Island are not very old. They're about seven or 800 years old, a thousand years old at the most, nothing very interesting in terms of ancient history. How did they arrive at that date for stone monuments? Why, well, they arrived at it from organic material that had been pulled out of these platforms. Okay. And they deduce that the platform and the statues must be the same age. There's an immediate problem with that in all of the platforms. Actually, I can illustrate it very clearly in this one. Because if we go behind that platform, we discover that an ancient, heavily weathered Easter Island head has been actually used as a block in the construction of that platform. And that alone tells us that the platform is younger than the heads, younger than the statue. Uh, and we should not rely upon organic material pulled from this platform. That may be the work of a later culture which re-erected some of the Moa. We may be getting a falsely young date for the Moa. If you go to the Rana Raraku quarry, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of these amazing Easter Island heads sticking out of the ground. It's a really surreal, a really surreal experience. This is an ancient uh, crater. Um, and uh, you could be forgiven for thinking that these statues just go a meter or two under the ground, but Thor Heyerdahl proved the truth. Uh, these statues actually go 30 feet under the ground. And that has significant implications. And those implications, so far as I know, I think it's important to pay tribute to fellow researchers in this field. And so far as I know, the first, the first realization that this deep burial of these statues indicates great age was made by a, a writer called Frank Joseph in 2006 in a book called The Lost Civilization of Lemuria, The Rise and Fall of Words and, and Worlds. And the point he makes is that 5th century radiocarbon dates contradict the depths at which the Moai have been buried, not by human hands, but through natural deposition. Many of the monoliths stand up to their necks in soil. Some are completely covered. The time needed to obscure them under 20 or more feet of earth uh, is involved millennia, not centuries. And more recently, since 2010, Professor Robert Schock, professor of geology at Boston University, who's world famous for his redating work on the Great Sphinx of Giza, uh, has made his way to Easter Island, and he's picked up on this uh, theory that was originally proposed in, 19, in 2006, and he's looked at this sedimentation and he is absolutely satisfied that this sedimentation must have taken thousands of years to fill in. That in a tiny island like that, it can't happen in just seven or eight hundred or even a thousand five hundred years. Thousands and thousands of years. Um, I'm being told that we're nearly ten minutes from the end. And, and actually that's good because I'm exactly ten minutes from the end. Um, I, I'm here. We'll have to do questions and answers after the second talk. Uh, I'm here with Thor Heyerdahl. Um, I, I had the privilege of knowing him in Tenerife in, in the 31st of June uh, 2000. Thor Heyerdahl was a great believer in the lost civilization of Atlantis. Uh, and of course, he did a huge amount of work at Tiwanaku and at Easter Island. Um, I think if Thor Heyerdahl had lived to be aware of the, what the excavations at Gobek Vitepi had exposed, he would have been intrigued by the hand position of the Moai which are matched by the hand positions of the T-shaped megaliths at Gobekli Tepe, this meeting of the hands in front of the belly. Uh, and of course, uh, those Easter Island figures, those aren't just huge chins, these are bearded figures we're looking at. They're wearing heavy beards. And that reminds us of the bearded civilizers, the, 
the seven sages of Mesopotamia. As a matter of fact, tradition is that civilization was brought to Easter Island in remote antiquity by seven initiated men who arrived by boat from the lost land of Heba and who established and laid out the island's future sacred landscape. Bearded figures. Uh, here, don't tell me that this is a central, uh, an, an indigenous Central American Indian. This is a, a strange looking bearded figure found in the same stratum as this image of Quetzalcoatl, the civilization bringer to Mexico. Uh, and we find these anomalous bearded, really not Native American Indian looking uh, imagery all over uh, ancient, ancient Mexico. What's going on here? Osiris himself is a, a bearded figure and also a bringer of the gifts of civilization. And he was said to have reigned in the remote past, in the epoch that the ancient Egyptians called Zeptepi, the first time. When was the first time? Well, we talked about the Sphinx. And this is what happens when you precess the skies back to the epoch of 12,800 to 11,600 years ago. Remember, these changes unfold very slowly. During that whole epoch, what go on on the spring equinox, it was the constellation of Leo that housed the sun. An hour before sunrise, the Sphinx would have been gazing exactly at its celestial counterpart lying on the horizon in the age of Leo, 12,800 or so years ago. And then an hour passes, the sun bisects the horizon, and the constellation of Orion, which is the celestial image of the god Osiris, sits due south on the meridian, the north-south line that divides the sky above your head with its stars in the pattern of the three pyramids on the ground. That pattern is wrong in 2,500 BC. The angle of the stars is completely off, but it's right in the epoch of 10,500 BC. And this is the work of my friend and colleague, Robert Bovard. And then there's the Sphinx, the geological evidence of the Sphinx. John Anthony West was the person who originally had the intuition that the Sphinx is much older than we're told, that it dates back way beyond 2500 BC. And it was John Anthony West who brought Professor Robert Schock from Boston University to the site. Um, and uh, they argued that the, Robert Schock is a specialist in this area. He looked at the weathering in the trench surrounding the Sphinx. Much of the weathering on the core body of the Sphinx has been covered up by repair blocks, but it's there. And Schock is absolutely satisfied this is the result of exposure to at least a thousand years of very heavy rain. And you do not get that rainfall in Giza in the last 5,000 years. You have to go back to the massive rain out that occurred during the Younger Dryas to get that kind of rains that could have caused the precipitation induced weathering on the Sphinx. Now, of course, Egyptologists, Mark Lane and Zahi Hawass, back in 1992, when the Sphinx was originally proposed to be 12,000 years old, Egyptologists rejected that. They said, rubbish, it's absolute rubbish. Of course the Sphinx isn't 12,000 years old. We know the Sphinx is just 4,500 years old, even though there's no inscription that tells us that. Uh, we know that the Sphinx is just 4,500 years old. And besides, if there had been a culture in the world that was capable of creating the Sphinx 12,000 years ago, why, they would have made lots of other sites that we would have found, and those sites are nowhere to be seen. Well, they could say that in 1992, but they can't say it today. If you can create Quebec Duquette, you can create the Sphinx. I think we're looking at the fingerprints of a lost civilization in both places. So the evidence is mounting, though most of the later construction is of high quality, that the edifice of our past, built by historians and archaeologists, stands on defective and dangerously unsound foundations. And by the way, I've only shared a small element of the evidence. I've not talked about the 20,000-year-old pyramid in Indonesia, for example. An extinction-level cataclysm occurred on our planet between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And this event was global in its consequences and it affected mankind profoundly. It's not even the fault of the archaeologists. The scientific evidence has only come in in the last decade and they've not had time to properly factor it into their model. But we are now obliged to contemplate the possibility that everything we've been taught about the origins of civilization could be wrong. And I'll finish, I promise, about five minutes, uh, with this question, what of the future of civilization? We now know that NASA's reassuring figure of 100 million year intervals between extinction level events is complacent and irresponsible. Uh, we know that the evidence has just come in of another big event 56 
billion years ago. And we've seen the evidence for the Younger Dryas impact. NASA seems often to make reassuring statements that turn out on closer examination to be based on incomplete data sets. For example, NASA says that none of the asteroids or comets it's identified will come close enough to impact Earth any time in the foreseeable future. Quote, all known potentially hazardous asteroids have less than a 0.01% chance of impacting Earth in the next 100 years. That's NASA in August 2015. The problem is that NASA actually has no idea how many potentially hazardous asteroids DHAs exist. It can only report the number it's spotted so far, presently totaling 1,635, of which 877 have diameters of a kilometer or more. It's true, there's very little likelihood of any of these known objects hitting the Earth in the next 100 years. However, it's the as yet unidentified and unknown objects that should really concern us. Scientists estimate that so far only 1% of potentially hazardous asteroids have been identified, with 99%, more than 100,000 of these things, still awaiting discovery. Just last year, uh, NASA spotted an asteroid that whizzed by between the Earth and the Moon. That's a really near miss. They only found it 10 days before it passed us by. The implication is that there's an awful lot out there, and many scientists are realizing this. Earth could be at risk of meteor impacts, and we might wrongly have assumed we're living in a safe era. And it's the torrid meteor stream that is of particular concern. I liken it to strapping on a blindfold and crossing an eight-lane interstate twice a year and just hoping that we don't meet any traffic. Or if we do, that it would be bicycles or motorcycles rather than trucks. The torrid meteor stream. The scientists I've mentioned, their research and calculations, they've also worked with Emilio Spedicato at the University of Bergamo. Their research and calculations indicate that in addition to the known torrid objects, for example, Enki, Olgiato, Rudniki, all in the range of two to five kilometers in diameter, there are also between one and 200 asteroids of more than a kilometer in diameter orbiting within the torrid meteor stream. All of them remnants of that giant comet that first entered the solar system more than 20,000 years ago. Amongst them, these scientists believe that there is at least one very large and as yet undetected object estimated to be 30 kilometers in diameter. This unique complex of debris, they write, is undoubtedly the greatest collision hazard facing the Earth at the present time. There's no need for gloom and doom. We do not have to go the way of the dinosaurs. We have the technology right now to sweep our cosmic environment clean. It exists, but it's not being deployed. Why? Because of money. NASA is putting its focus, and other space agencies are putting their focus on other issues, not on this issue. And of course, where does the big money go in our society? The big money in our society goes to military expenditure. No problem to raise hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars to create the ever more sophisticated ways of murdering one another en masse. We're able to raise the money for that, but right now, NASA, and it's increased its budget in the last year or two, NASA right now is spending just $50 million a year on observing our cosmic environment hazards. $50 million is the price of one attack helicopter. It's peanuts. We are getting our priorities completely wrong. This is something we can do something about to protect the Earth, to protect this beautiful gem of a planet for future generations. And I'll close on this, uh, on this point. Um, this is the Earth viewed from space. And you can see the areas of technological advance because they're electrified. And they light up at night like a chain of jewels. Here's Europe, and down here, Africa is almost dark because there's so little electrification uh, in Africa. Uh, of course, when you're living in one of these brightly lit cities, this is, this is Hong Kong, actually, but when you're living in one of these brightly lit cities, you can't even see the sky because of light pollution. But when you look down on the Earth from space, this is, this is the amazing thing that you see. And this is often taken as a, as a sign of our technological advance. This is the great achievement that we light up space in the way that we do. Uh, and uh, you can see it also on the, on the Western Hemisphere. There's North America glowing. There's the Amazon base, completely, almost completely dark, with only a few spots of light in it. And we know that the Amazon basin has hunter-gatherer 
populations who don't even know we exist. Occasionally an aircraft will fly over and they'll look up and they'll think, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> now, these are the these are the meek. These are the meek and humble of the earth. These are the people that Plato called the unlettered and the uncultured. If we were to face, if we were to face a cataclysm on the scale of the events that happened 12, 000, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, I do not believe that our advanced technological societies that light up the skies like this, I don't believe that our advanced technological societies would survive it. Human, humanity would survive, but industrial technological civilization would go down, I think it would go down very fast. We think we're strong, but actually we're weak. We are, none of us really know how to survive. Well, probably some of, some of us do, but the vast majority of people in the industrialized countries have no notion of survival. They don't have a clue, as a matter of fact. It all depends on a complex interrelated network of skills that create the technological abundance that we enjoy. Those who would survive such a capitalism would be the hunter-gatherers, because the hunter-gatherers know how to survive. They're in the business of survival. Such a global capitalism would pass them by largely untouched. They, they, their, their culture would go on, while our culture went down. And who's to say, 10,000 years from now, the stories that their descendants would be telling? Might they not speak of a time when there was an advanced civilization on this planet, so advanced, they were almost like gods. They could send men to the moon. They could fly around our Earth in a matter of hours. They could speak to one another on opposite sides of the planet. But they became cruel. They became callous. They became greedy. They began to impose their power upon others around the world. They became excessively materialistic. They forgot that we are really here to nurture spirit. They ceased to carry their prosperity with moderation. And the universe slapped them down. So I would say, let's make sure we're not the next lost civilization. Thank you. Too long. Uh, we were supposed to be doing Q&A for half an hour, but we're going to make time for that somehow today. Um, my understanding is we're taking an hour break now. Yes, we're going to take an hour break now. Uh, and then I'm going to be talking psychedelics this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you.